you all uh, for uh, coming in and uh, you know participating in this. Uh, when Pradeep uh, called me up and said, you know, uh, can you do one session? I was like, okay, no, I don't know uh, what I need to speak, but you know, uh, he told me leave, keep it open. So I will leave it open, and maybe I'll go into a certain uh, directions of my career, and then uh, and then industry, how industry evolved. Uh, you know, through my career lens is what I thought I should talk about. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Manish as well as and Anurag for uh, partnering with uh, Analytics India Magazine and me for doing this. So, uh, one of the things I think, uh, you know, if I look at if we look at the evolution of uh, you know so-called analytics into advanced analytics to data science into machine learning or AI, I mean, in the end of the day, uh, you know. It all starts with data, right? It all starts with data. I mean, I think uh, nobody uh, nobody can undermine the importance of the data, no matter how much you, you are talking about neural network to reinforcement learning to all that. I think which all which all comes later, right? So even when I started my career way back in the late 90s, it was the importance was always given to data, and those times even the comp, you know. Uh, Companies never heard of what is analytics, right? I mean, there was very handful of companies who had to do analytics because that was the crux of the business they had. For example, as a survey research agency uh, trying to understand the consumer sentiment of a product through a qualitative or a quantitative mechanism, had to analyze the data, right? Uh, and you're doing qualitative research at that point in time, you would record it in a uh, tape recorder. You will you will hear that conversation and again and again, and you pick up these words, which which in our language today we call it as features, right? And and note down those features from a from a through uh, through listening to the tape again and again, and then you are modeling it in your head, saying that okay, these are the features which is contributing to my uh, products recall or a products growth and stuff like that. It's it's a it's a mind modeling you are doing as a researcher. You shift that into a quantitative style, which is more of a survey research based, uh, you know, uh, analysis when you do. Yes, you have the data, right? Okay, because you have spoken to certain, certain consumers through a stratified random sampling or any other sampling method. And you, you actually go to a hypothesis, you form a hypothesis and start analyzing your data, right? And that's why. You know, you know, those times, late 90s and early 2000s, a lot of research agencies used to work on advanced analytics, uh, you know, with, with the lesser data. Today, there is a problem when you have a, too much of data, people are figuring it out, how do I work with lesser data and apply neural networks? Then the problem was, oh, I just have very few data points. Uh, I still have to make use of it, right? And then we, that's when we used started using uh, principal component analysis, factor, I mean, uh, discriminant analysis, cluster, uh, correspondence analysis to understand the association of, uh, of uh, you know, association with a certain brand uh, consumer would have all that. So uh, those days, you know, uh, to be, uh, I mean, if I look at look at, I mean, the reason I'm saying this is a lot of things. Have, I mean, what has changed the the methodologies and the how you approach a problem from a research lens or a methodology lens hasn't changed. Just that the 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 technology landscape, everything else has changed. So, but the crux of the problem or the uh, the or where you have to always look at it is data, right? 80% of what you do today, if you take a machine learning project today, 100%, I mean, and, and divide that, 80% is you trying to make sense of data from a business language, right? You uh, And trying to understand a correlation, trying to understand uh, the association, trying to understand the features, trying, I mean, those days we used to call it as variables, and understanding those makes so much of difference. The more you spend time with data, you get, I mean, we all say in our language, get married to the data, sleep with the data, in the right, I mean, in the right spirit. And then you, you start thinking about it, okay, now how do I solve for my why, right? So those days also, we used to do that, but in a very limited capacity, right? I mean, we used to have our database today, people use SQL to MongoDB to Cosmos DB or all that, but those days we were relying on DBase 4 or FOX Pro. 
and then our programming languages used to be if i had to do a scientific computing i have to do a uh, say conjoint matrix i used to have, uh, certain things or i used to rely on fortran or i used to rely on uh, you know uh, pack, uh, uh, we used to rely on packages like merlin quantum spss programming and this these are eras before uh, you know windows 3.1 or windows 95 had just come into india uh, to work on right so so even then the 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 idea was to get to their data understand the data all then then in the 2000s as we go through the today you know uh, as we went through the 2000s and 2004 5 6 7 that's when people started realizing you know how how important it is uh, you know the the what was seen as analytics as very different uh, uh, breed altogether. People started taking as analytics are more valuable, more value to it, and companies started doing it. Right? And and you would still see a lot of analytics even then was getting done in either in banking or in mostly in consumer research, consumer retail space where uh, you have tons of data coming from a Nielsen or an IRI or a or a GFK or a, you know or any of the banking banking sectors and stuff like that where you have to use uh, credit card fraud detection or a collection modeling. How do I how do I increase my cash flow? How do I increase my uh, uh, decrease my fraud fraud transaction all that? So that's an, you know uh, the yuga of uh, you know the uh, you know how I mean uh, till then in India you know statistics mathematics and you take it and as an MSc or a M Tech mathematics from any premium institute you are seen as okay you are going into a profession of teaching that uh, okay teaching statistics or teaching mathematics in any any of the uh, any of the other institutes but that's when you know people getting into corporate jobs uh, I still remember we still remember. Uh, going into campuses in 2004 and 5 and 6 is uh, 6 to you know uh, things like in the places like ISI, IIT Kharagpur, IIT Kanpur, IIT Delhi, and recruiting those folks for the future, right? And investing in those for the future. And the and and that talent helped us to build the uh, uh, I think a lot of lot a lot of companies if you look at uh, uh, in the analytics companies uh, if you take the top 10 top 20 companies in in India if you look at it. I think that those are the uh, those are the people today, which is which is actually at the at the middle or a senior level, which is which is thriving this industry today, right? Because the because fundamentally they were they were taught that data is most important. You have to look at data very scientifically, statistically, uh, all that. And then uh, machine learning kicked in from a from a computer science angle. So you have uh, computer science angle and there was a huge debate between probabilistic versus deterministic. Right? I mean, uh, but at the end of the day, you, uh, one could argue that you know regression. If I look at it from a, uh, if I remove the statistics of what of, of the regression, regression is still a machine learning. It's a machine learning language, machine learning technique. So, so I think now there is a there is a convergence. There's an understanding that it's not everything is deterministic. A lot of things are still probabilistic. And then you you started looking at and then in the uh, uh, from 2010 onwards, there was an exodus of uh, you know uh, data coming in because of uh, you know whether it is you you if we can use social media or you can blame it on the devices we have we can develop or any any other mo mode of uh, you know their data generation mechanism right. But that storage went cheaper, computing power went cheaper, and then people started dusting out a lot of research papers people have done done it in you know starting in 60s 70s 80s 90s be it a random forest be it a lstm model be it a neural network model that's when people re started realizing the value of okay now the storage has become cheaper uh, people also started trying to create uh, algorithms for uh, to work on a gpu machines right now with thanks thanks to google's and microsoft's of the world Tensor flows or uh, Keras and uh, five torches of the world made it made it much more a little more easier so that you could you could use that on a on a GPU uh, and it's it's a you know and I mean there is a notion also in the market that you know uh, GPUs of uh, GPUs like five times CPU it's just the same same concept it is not the same concept there's a graphical process unit which is a, which is a how 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 the other one works so 
all that today has made it a lot more easier uh, to work on algorithm. But the fundamentals are still hasn't changed because if you are not able to understand the business problem in a very uh, from a, whether it is a CFO uh, lens or a CMO lens or a chief risk officer lens or a chief supply chain officer lens or a uh, uh, you know chief sales officer lens and understand the underlying data which is being given to you from that lens and convert that a business problem into a mathematical or a statistical mathematical problem convert and solution that at, at a mathematical level you make it as a mathematical solution and then convert that mathematical solution into a business solution and articulate that you know in, in that full chain no data science project will be will be uh, successful right i mean you may have applied the greatest of the algorithms in with the with the with the with the uh, you know high precision high recall all that but if you're not solving that cfo's top line problem or a bottom line problem in the in this in this scenario nothing's you know it's it's not useful to have that's why that's why people say you know data science is a black box and it's our job as an industry uh, you know with, uh, as a as a as a fellow industry uh, industry people in this in the analytics that we make it more consumable to the business users from the lens of using it uh, you know, more appropriately for their business decision making right and that's what we are, we are looking for i mean you would see tons of articles and everybody writing about explainable ai explainable ai people experimenting with lime or sap or whatever but end of the day your understanding as a data scientist uh and along with i, I you know the business guy who's telling you the problem in from uh, you know what he is what he is trying to solve for and getting the data and under and chopping the data and understanding that we, we call it as data wrangling and data data munging and all stuff like that but in the end it's all about are you getting the y and you are you getting the x's properly and you are you going to trying to get that understanding thoroughly right and doing your own research and keep in mind i mean th there is one more trend in the industry that which is which is good and bad at time because there is a trend that people think that uh, you know i will recruit two data scientists and uh, you know they can solve anything under the sun right no not really uh, there is no the 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 concept of the full stack data scientist still is a myth because uh, the data scientist today uh, uh, you know uh, is there are there are, there are uh, how I, how we how do we define the data science today in the market is is the type of data we use today right uh, structured data requires a different treatment unstructured data if it is a text or emails and uh, blogs and there are, uh, running text record uh, requires a different uh, treatment and third uh, the images require a different treatment videos re require a different treatment so so end of the day your machine uh, stu classical structured data language who understands data models who understand logical data models who understand entity relationship all that is very different versus uh, somebody who can solve uh, natural language processing through classical text mining approaches or a computer vision guy to uh, images and videos and then you you look at who's who who's good in what right i mean in the sense if you are going to production some algorithm at the at the at the end of the pro project you would need a good programmer also in your team so so you have to uh, the, the one of the why i'm bringing this out today is earlier you know no no one was looking at productionizing it or uh, in uh, or deploying the models and trying to uh, use those models on a day-to-day -day basis earlier used to be used to get a project yes i need to understand my roi impact on this particular ad okay I get the data, I understand the data, I spend a lot of time, I put a, a proposal in place or a top management summary in place and send a present data client, client is happy. Today, you need to deploy it. So at the start of the project, it's very important to, to get the pod in place. We call it as pod because in a pod, you have many roles to do. One, it could be a data engineer who understands, you know, data pipelines, who understand, uh, uh, you know, how do you how do you get uh, do the uh, you know api connections how do you get the data into into a into a into a data mart and stuff 
to an, a good uh, one or two data scientists, depending upon the data, who's a, uh, maybe a good mathematician or maybe a good uh, computer uh, computer vision guy, depending upon the problem. Third, you need a ML. I mean, one of the th roles which I think people should think of is which is getting immersed in this industry today is ML engineer. Right? ML engineering is how do you when you are doing uh, containerization, Dockerization. Uh, how do you how do you uh, you know uh, do the uh, complete deployment of the solution? All that and and these are the various roles. And so there is a there is a this one in the industry that not, unless you are an algorithm specialist, unless I know a decision tree uh, or a C 4.5, I am not a data scientist. No, uh, there are plenty of roles in the periphery of data science. One can pick it up based on your background, right? A software engineer who's 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 a good Java programmer uh, who understand the Java end-to-end -end J2E ecosystem can upskill themselves on an on a on a Dockerization on a on an ML engineering part, and that's that's that may be your role because you may be failing yourself, uh, you know, going into something which is very unknown to you. The idea is to capitalize the experience you already have. And and look and go and cast the near you know near the, what is there near to you and capitalize on that because I see a trend in the industry everybody wants to do uh, machine learning uh, but understand there are only very few people who are actually doing machine learning but but the, around that there are so many so many uh, so many jobs and so many roles one can play so that's that's the crux of the things i just want to uh, leave it uh, you know as uh, some piece of uh, as uh, you know some uh, you know suggestions from my end uh, through uh, my career and maybe i will now leave it to uh, other panelists to talk about their journey and what they see in the industry and today i can just tell you in the last two weeks uh, one of the some of the things which we are doing which we are seeing in the market is i think a lot of people are gearing up for pre-day, uh, pre-COVID versus post-COVID, right? I mean, like, uh, what do I mean? A lot of things are changing. The norms are changing. The ways of working is changing. Uh, clients are more open for, uh, you know, earlier days people would say, "Oh, I need this ma this guy to be in Gurgaon, or I need this guy to be in Calcutta, or this guy to be in a, in uh, you know in Boston in my Boston office." But that's changing today, and you know. More and more collaboration, uh, irrespective of where you are, uh, and data science is a team game, right? And till, till maybe uh, we all think the co-location is so important, but the ways of co-location and how you solve and make it as a collective intelligence and collective problem solving is changing. And we see a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of in the last two weeks, I can tell you, working from home, working, uh, interacting with. Uh, fellow data scientists sitting in different house, uh, you know, homes in Bangalore or a Gurgaon. You know, it's slightly frustrating, but I think we are getting used to it. And I think there is a there is a new industry norm which is getting created. That's one. Second, I think the priority analytics is seen as a discretionary expenses in most companies, right? Now, but while it is seen as a discretionary expenses, I think a lot of companies are trying to under, uh, are realizing now that. You, they have to act now and try to do uh, the future from an uncertainty standpoint. How do you do analytics in uncertainty? So what that means, you need scenario-based modeling. You need scenario-based calculation. You need scenario-based forecasting. So that's what it, it is coming to. Uh, you know, I don't have an answer saying that how the industry would be post-COVID, but I think we all. I mean, I think skills will not. I mean, if you if you if you have the skills to understand the data and treat the data and uh, convert business problem into a business solutions through mathematics or engineering solution engineering through creative thinking when i say creative thinking it is your uh, curiosity and trying to understand the business uh, i think everybody will thrive is what what i would say so pradeep over to you uh, you know uh, uh, i think that's that's my few cents uh, yes, hope everyone can uh, hear me fine and uh, can see my screen. Uh, Pradeep, can you sort of confirm you can see my screen? Yes, yes, Mr. Oh, Manish, I can see your screen. Yeah, perfect. Let me just very quickly minimize this thing. Uh, yep, uh, maybe pull it down. Yep, okay. Um, 
So uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for taking your time to, uh, you know, be present in this session. I think I can. Uh, yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. I think I can just pull it down. Yeah, and should be good. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you everyone for you know taking your time out uh, and um, uh, for this session. Right. Uh, I know it is difficult times and uh, every moment that you uh, want to spend for anything else counts at this point. OK, so my name is Manish Gupta and thanks Pradeep for introducing for an awesome introduction. Um, I work as a principal applied scientist at Microsoft. I also work as a as a as a visiting faculty at ISB and an, as an adjunct faculty at IIIT Hyderabad. Right. Uh, my talk uh, um, uh, today is going to be in two parts. In the first part, uh, you know, on behalf of ISB, I'm going to talk about uh, the the uh, details of this advanced management program in business analytics that we have here. Uh, uh, you know, uh, which is where I basically interact uh, or or um, uh, or participate in ISB events. Right. Uh, and then the second part is going to be uh, a summary of deep learning. Uh, in some senses, you can think of it as introduction to deep learning. Um, I call it summary because essentially it is actually a summary of the 10 hours course that I uh, take as part of this AMPBA uh, at ISB, right? So it's going to be like a half an hour uh, summary uh, in uh, really right of, of that of that course, right? So I'll get started. So uh, AMPBA uh, is Advanced Management Program in Business Analytics, uh, and uh, it is uh, uh, it is organized by ISB Institute of Data Science, right? So um, the format of the program is uh, it's a part time executive program designed to maximize the learning with minimum disruption to professional responsibilities. So the idea is, uh, uh, you know, even when I actually go and teach, it is much easier for me to go and teach because, uh, uh, you know, it allows uh, for this uh, as little, um, uh, you know, a disruption to your uh, to your actual work activities. Right. So a whole bunch of these days are Saturday Sundays, which makes it easier for everyone to participate. Right. Um, so the emphasis is on action and application rather than just theory and concepts. So there is going to be a whole bunch of tutorials, a whole bunch of faculty lectures, um, uh, case study discussions, uh, um, simulations, group activities, and whatnot. Right. So the program is actually taught by globally renowned faculty from ISB, uh, other premier schools, and subject matter experts from industry uh, like like myself, uh, like uh, like Shailesh, who also joins from Reliance, and and so on. So a whole bunch of people. Right. Um, uh, a whole uh, you know, a lot of faculty is also from uh, from various business schools in the US. Uh, they come with extensive extensive practical experience in research and business analytics, and uh, each of them sort of brings in unique insights in addition to their functional expertise. I mean, you know, to tell you the truth, uh, you know, when I when I teach uh, at ISB, I end up having uh, breakfast discussions with other faculty members, and uh, you know, I myself learn something from them uh, every time I have faculty. Uh, I have I have breakfast with them. I, so uh, uh, peer learning from uh, uh, experienced fellow participants is also encouraged. A whole bunch of people uh, uh, who are peers in this particular program are actually heads of analytics, founders, and CXOs at various places. So in fact, I have had almost every year, um, uh, you know, there are at least five, six people joining from Microsoft. Some of them are actually at uh, very high positions, very senior positions, and they still um, sort of uh, attend these uh, so as to sharpen themselves uh, uh, in this, this new field of AIML in that sense. Right. Um, uh, so uh, applied learning, I mean, the, the focus of the AMPB program is applied learning uh, through two kinds of uh, uh, initiatives. One are called as foundational projects, which run through the program. They cut across various modules and they help participants build capabilities so as to sort of solve business problems by taking real case studies, applying the data science uh, process so as to say on these case studies. Uh, and then, uh, uh, you know, the entire thing culminates with a with the capstone project at the end. So uh, through this uh, three to six months long capstone project, uh, you end up uh, actually working on a on a project as you would do if you were, uh, you know, if you were to act like a real data scientist in on a on, in a real corporate scenario, right? So uh, there's a whole bunch of learning infrastructure. Um, thanks to the awesome infrastructure that uh, ISB has in some senses uh, with Learning Resource Center. Uh, you know, if you have never visited ISB, uh, you could visit sometime, you know, to look at the awesome library, uh, Learning Resource Center, which, uh, which has like databases, volumes, uh, catalogs, e-journals, database, uh, you know, all kinds of things. Uh, uh, and uh, cross-functional learning from various research centers and institutes. There are multiple, multiple research centers. Uh, so Institute of Data Science is not the only one. Many other uh, centers whom we can in interact with, incubation centers like D-Labs and AIC and, and various campus facilities. Right. Um, uh, so uh, curriculum wise, this is what is sort of covered in AMPBA uh, uh, foundational courses like uh, R and Python. 
right uh core modules uh, which is uh, uh, basically covering uh, the whole gamut of uh, things that one can talk about as part of aiml so uh and uh, uh, so it's it's not completely like cap technical focus so it's a techno business uh, course as i would really call it so when i sort of compare it with uh, other kinds of places so for example when i think of my work at microsoft it's completely completely applied in that senses when i think of uh, uh, what i teach at triple it it's completely engineering oriented and this course is uh, is is a very nice mix of engineering and business concepts so um, so you know um, uh, i mean covering various kinds of important concepts like uh, um, like text analytics uh, how to handle unstructured data uh, foundations of big data so um, uh, and and topics uh, uh, in big data uh, you know and and again the topics in big data are not just from an engineering perspective where you could uh, essentially uh, maybe learn about map reduce how to spark big and hive in some senses uh, even externally but you know more from a business standpoint also that hey how do you apply these in real world uh, thanks to the wide uh, experience uh, that the faculty uh, comes from so in fact i have taught one of those big data course sets also at some point and i used to talk about uh, uh, you know massive data handling and algorithms for massive data handling the way we handle those kinds of things at microsoft right so um, so each of them has a has this business application perspective uh, along with of course the core concepts um so um, besides uh, core courses like uh, you know these optimization kind of things uh, um, uh, core engineering courses like optimization data visual uh, uh, optimization text analytics uh, data mining and things of uh, regression analysis kind of things there are also these uh, uh, business courses which talk more about uh, business communications and storytelling uh, financial analytics and so on right so uh, and then there are advanced modules uh, which uh, capture uh, um, uh, you know both uh, uh, traditional mechanisms of doing these things as well as the new ones so for example there is uh, there's machine learning modules supervised unsupervised machine learning uh, uh, and there are also these uh, uh, futuristic outlook kind of modules uh, on deep learning applications of artificial intelligence and so on right so uh, there are completely application oriented modules as well so for example customer analytics uh, supply chain analytics pricing analytics digital media analytics again focusing on various kinds of application domains that our uh, students come from in general right healthcare analytics blockchain hr analytics fraud analytics all of them and then as as i discussed earlier as well the experiential experiential uh, learning modules uh, foundation projects as well as the capstone project right so that's that now that was the first part of my talk uh, right uh, uh, in the second part uh, uh, i'm going to talk about uh, you know uh, an introduction to deep learning so um, and as i said this is like a summary of a 10 hour course that i actually take um, you know if you don't know deep learning uh, i think this is going to be a nice uh, uh, half an hour spent um, uh, in knowing a new field right so uh, and and when i sort of uh, try to learn something new right i think you should come with the curiosity of a kid uh, kid like a 5 year old kid trying to learn something new and that uh, helps you learn a whole bunch right so for people who know deep learning uh, sure this is going to be a revision in some senses think of it more like a revision right so hopefully you will enjoy this journey let's get started okay um yeah so let's get started um, so you know 5 years ago or rather i should now say you know even earlier so maybe like uh, 8 to 10 years ago um, if you ask computers to actually solve very simple tasks like these they would miserably fail at that right so what is the task so on the left hand side you are given a picture like uh, uh, which contains a dog and a cat and the question that you want to answer is that uh, uh, does this picture contain a dog right these are called captchas and we solve these captchas frequently uh, when we are trying to book that irctc ticket or trying to log in on to some portal and so on right uh, now you know even though my 3 year old kid can actually very very easily solve this task computers were poor at solving them so 80% accuracy was the best reported on this captcha task it is a benchmark asira captcha task and on that benchmark uh, computers miserably failed so other kind of cognitive tasks like speech actually uh, also uh, had similar issues so and speech the task was um, you know speech to text conversion so a speech to speech to text transcription okay so uh, you know i mean uh, if you basically uh, uh, try to transcribe whatever i am speaking uh, uh, to to real words machine readable words the error rate was like uh, the best error rate was 14% so 14% of the words uh, the machine could just not understand right Uh, or or understand wrongly right and that was poor i mean actually even a fifth grade kid uh, fifth grade kid if i basically tell him hey just write down whatever i say uh, yeah well this guy will take time but will write out everything nicely okay 
So the modern computer, uh, not really modern, modern now. I mean, the computer before deep learning uh, was still far off from some of the basic capabilities that a human brain has. Uh, you know, and uh, this I'm talking about uh, based on uh, uh, huge amounts of literature in machine learning, right? So people had been doing, have been doing machine learning for ages, okay? So let me be very clear, right? Uh, there have been like, people have been working on machine learning since decades. So machine learning has become a hype now um, or has become very popular now. Um, uh, hype is a wrong word, popular now, uh, but it has been there for quite some time, right? Uh, but even after so much of progress, we cannot even beat a three-year-old kid, right? So that's bad. Right. So how can we mimic the human brain is what this all started with. So people were like uh, neurologists had also made a lot of progress understanding the human brain. They understood what parts of the brain correspond to different uh, kinds of uh, senses that we have and so on. Uh, but then the idea was uh, that, hey, uh, you take this human brain and can we sort of build an artificial human brain? OK, so an artificial system which mimics the way uh, uh, the way uh, we, the way we behave. Right. So, and uh, you know, this this uh, uh, picture might be nostalgic in nature. It might remind you of uh, uh, what you saw in school. Um, so in the sense, uh, uh, you know, a picture of a neuron. So all of us know that our brain and our nervous system is made up of all these little, little neurons. And in fact, there are insanely large of them, but each of those neurons looks like this. It has a cell body, so to say, right? Uh, with a nucleus inside it. And then it actually has, uh, uh, you know, multiple inputs coming into that cell and there's an output going uh, to other connections to other neurons, right? So the idea was that, hey, can we sort of mimic this uh, this entire infrastructure or sort of say this entire uh, natural neuron as an artificial neuron? Because that would be the basis to actually build a neural network, so to say, an artificial neural network, right? So neurologists had done a whole bunch of medical science. They had observed that, uh, hey, the way our neural network works is basically like an electric electrical network, okay? So for example, the neurons on my retina essentially try to sense light, and whenever they sense light, they basically send messages over these synaptic junctions or basically these connections, right, to other neurons, which excite them or inhibit them in the sense that uh, these signals could be excitatory, basically meaning, you know, they, they make the next uh, neuron, the downstream neuron work, or they basically, you know, uh, are inhibitory. They basically stop its working, right? So now, uh, you know, uh, the idea is that any of these neurons actually depended on the inputs coming from uh, the other neurons. And whenever those inputs basically uh, reached a threshold, these uh, neurons, this particular neuron would get excited and output a one in that sense. Okay. Now, having understood this kind of stuff from neurologists, uh, essentially, um, you know, our machine learning scientists basically said that, hey, let us actually build an artificial neuron as the neurologist told us, right? So basically started off saying that, hey, uh, you know, a natural neuron essentially does two things. It integrates uh, the input coming from multiple sources and, uh, you know, it outputs something, uh, you know, a zero or a one, depending on whether the input crossed a particular threshold. Okay. So that's what these guys did. I mean, they basically uh, build an artificial neuron, which has these two functions, integration function and an activation function. The integration function basically uh, summed up all the inputs coming from various sources and then an activation function tried to sort of apply a threshold on top of this sum and uh, uh, output a zero or a one depending on uh, uh, depending on whether the integration output was greater than a threshold or not right now you know what our natural neurons are very uh, uh, are, 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 are have been tuned over years and years of our experience so each of those neurons basically knows how much weight to give to each of those inputs okay so um, and in fact, you know, it turns out our entire nervous system has 10 raised to 11 neurons. Now that's insanely large, right? That's basically about 100 billion in number, right? And each neuron is actually connected to about 1000 other neurons. So that's a massively, massively connected network that we have inside each of us, right? Now, you know, each of that neuron over experiences and experiences has been trained so as to sort of understand how much importance to give the, to the inputs that it is receiving, okay? So for example, this particular neuron, it may have like thousand inputs, but how much importance or how much weight to give to each of those inputs, it has learned over time, okay? So, and that is what we want our artificial neuron to also do, you know? It must sum up all of those inputs coming in, but then it must do a weighted summation. So it must basically give some sort of weights, uh, you know, understanding how much important each of those input signals is. Uh, so that was uh, how, you know, McCullough and Pitts actually proposed an artificial neural model. Uh, this was 1943. It's not something new, right? Neural networks are as old as 1943. 
but uh, uh, you know now they are of course hot as of now because there's a whole bunch of compute infrastructure that we have now which was not available in 1943 we have a whole bunch of labeled data which we didn't have in 1943 and we have a whole bunch of optimized algorithms which can run much much faster thousands of times faster than what they could run in 1943 okay so you know this is where it all started uh, these guys mccullough and pitts actually said hey we, this is how we'll mimic a natural neuron and create an artificial neuron now of course just like typical machine learning there's some sort of a learning when you are trying to build this neuron and the learning is about learning these weights how much importance to give to various features or inputs coming in uh, so as to finally come up with a prediction why so as to finally decide how you know what should be the prediction okay and then you could practically use this neuron to do all kinds of things for example given a photo try to figure out whether it contains a dog or not given a photo try to contain uh, try to try to predict whether it contains a particular disease or not and so on or uh, given a particular sentence try to predict whether um, you know uh, whether this review is positive or negative right uh, given uh, you know four features of a flower try to predict which particular uh, species of the flower this particular instance belongs to okay so uh, so this integration function and activation function were the things that people played around for quite some time so they basically said integration function is a simple thing where it takes all the inputs it does a weighted summation and computes the final output right Uh, and then people said activation function hmm so why just to basically do a threshold on top of whatever uh, the integration uh, function outputs uh, you know that can help us solve only a limited number of machine learning use cases typically called classification right why not actually let it output a number as well right so to be able to do that uh, they had to modify this uh, little artificial neuron to uh, not just output things based on uh, you know output 0 or 1 based on a threshold but output a number and the number could be anywhere from 0 to 1 so for example they could use a ram function or a sigmoid function or a tan hyperbolic scale sigmoid function right rather than just a step function as an activation function okay so second function in this artificial neuron could be replaced with any of these uh, particular choices and then you could come up uh, with uh, with various kinds of flexible neurons right now you know uh, 1943 these guys proposed this model and people would hand tune those weights and then say hey this weight makes sense for this problem this weight makes sense for that problem and so on right but then in 1962 uh, you know working with hollerith cards and the computers of the si- uh, you know a computer which was of the size of a room uh, uh, you know mr Ro- mr rosenblatt basically came up with this nice algorithm called as perceptron okay uh, perceptron uh, essentially was a was a major breakthrough in those days it essentially allowed to learn these weights automatically nobody had to manually decide what should be the weights that should be given to each of those inputs so as to come up with the final output okay perceptron uh, rosenblatt basically said that hey i am going to learn these weights based on labeled examples just like a kid learns based on uh, real life examples and real life experiences what uh, you know how much importance to give to various kinds of inputs okay so uh, and then he proposed this algorithm which he called as perceptron okay um so perceptron is an iterative algorithm so if you basically know uh, gradient descent kind of algorithms uh, you know it's it's one of those gradient descent algorithms so it starts off by saying that hey i will randomly initialize weights and then uh, you know based on the labeled data that i have based on the experiences or cases that are presented to the classifier i'm going to update my weights until the weights become optimal in nature or close to optimal in nature right uh, when the weights become close to optimal that's when i say that hey i have learned my neuron automatically i have not depended on any rule based systems or manually tuned weights but hey i have learned those weights automatically okay. so you know rosenblatt rosenblatt was very happy and so was the field of neural networks uh, but then over time right in 1969 uh, mr minsky basically said that hey you guys you guys seem to be very happy with this single neuron but uh, believe me the single neuron is no good okay there is a reason why we have a neural network inside of us um, you know um, a single neuron can actually just do linear separation so basically he said well a single neuron is great as a classifier or as a as a machine learning model uh, and thanks to rosenblatt you can you can train this model automatically big deal however it cannot solve all complicated problems right it can only solve problems which are popularly known as linearly separable classification problems okay so in fact a neural network a new a particular neuron a single neuron is no good than a single line okay so if you know other kinds of machine learning classifiers he basically said that hey it is as good as like a logistic regression or a svm classifier which are all linear classifiers okay 
and that is when people started thinking about building networks okay now networks was a very hodgepodge thing right i mean uh, uh, what kind of networks do you build so you could build uh, all connections to all connections so you could say that hey every neuron can be connected to every other neuron or uh, what you could do is to really build something systematic right so uh, people started with this thing called as mlps or multi layered perceptrons people said that hey we are going to organize neurons we have multiple we are going to have multiple neurons but we are going to keep them in a layered manner so there will be an output layer there will be an out, uh, input layer and there will be multiple hidden layers right now you know uh, in those days people just call, used to call them as mlps multi layered perceptrons well because they had multiple layers that's the way it is right and uh, you know how was this layer concept uh, made explicit well neurons are organized as layers right so within a layer neurons don't connect to each other they don't they don't talk to each other but across layers they basically connect with each other in fact a neuron connects to every other neuron in the next layer and every other neuron in the previous layer right so uh, no neurons talk to each other in the same layer and also neurons don't hop a layer so you know all the connections are across and uh, you know adjacent layers only okay so these mlps were good uh, uh, but you know uh, this field now in the past uh, eight years or so as i would call from 2012 has developed into a field called as deep learning now okay so uh, all up till here uh, you know was was sort of considered tradi as traditional machine learning but then people realized that hey there is so much into these multi layered perceptrons if you increase the depth if you increase the number of hidden layers magic happens right and that's what they have realized in the past 8 years or so and uh, this this has uh, uh, been considered as 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 the deep learning era the past 8 years or so okay so deep learning is essentially machine learning right but uh, neural network focused machine learning it basically handles uh, it basically is based on a whole bunch of algorithms we talked about perceptron algorithm of course we didn't go into detail because of the time uh, but there are more algorithms which are a part of the field of deep learning it is also based on a whole bunch of model architectures so you know we talked about a single neuron and an mlp there are uh, uh, various kinds of model architectures you know cnns for images rnns or lstms for 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 running text you know uh, uh, gnns or graph neural networks for for graphs uh, and and so on so there are a whole bunch of these architectures more recently you might have heard these buzzwords like transformers bert mtdnn you know or t5 and uh, uh, and 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 Microsoft Turing NLR and whatnot, right? So all of those are basically a part of deep learning. And uh, you know, people care about deep learning these days uh, uh, because it's so cute, right? It basically helps us understand how do how does human brain work. But not just that, right? People care about it because it is it does magic. It helps uh, uh, it helps enable those business use cases uh, which were simply impossible uh, before the deep learning era, right? Uh, in fact, uh, all of this started off in 2012. Uh, one of the Microsoft directors, Rick Rashid, uh, you know, in fact, a top scientist, essentially, uh, uh, you know, of course, he's a, not a Chinese guy, but uh, he went to China, a city called Tianjin in China, and he was demoing Microsoft's translator. Okay, so speech to speech translation. So he would speak in English and uh, people in China could hear the same stuff in Chinese. Okay, now that was uh, quite a courageous demo. Right, this guy not knowing Chinese at all, so he won't know if people are making fun of him in some senses, right? And uh, you know, still doing this demo, um, uh, asking people that hey, if you want to try it out, just try it out, and so on. And it worked so well that people actually asked him, hey, what did you use to be able to come up with such an awesome speech-to-speech -speech translation? Okay, uh, and and he basically mentioned deep learning, right? And since then, uh, actually, whichever phone you use, you have deep learning model installed on your machine, uh, which basically tries to understand your speech. Uh, uh, speech to text transcription so if you basically talk to your phone to search or in general to you know start off certain certain applications on your phone it's actually using deep learning in fact uh, some simple deep learning models are actually installed on your machine while more complicated ones run on those servers so essentially uh, if you basically uh, that is why you might have realized that if you're connected to the internet your your phone actually can recognize your accent and voice much better than it can if you're not connected right so uh, this was basically way back in 2012 and since then people have realized that deep learning can do wonders people have been uh, uh, buying companies based on deep learning or, or uh, you know promoting deep learning labs uh, deep learning is in fact everywhere in the past 5 years uh, uh, you know unlike other it uh, uh, it uh, you know uh, waves deep learning has seen its presence everywhere across sectors not just in it or internet and cloud sector right it is in biomedicine biology media entertainment security defense right even driverless cars, right? You name it, you name the field, you see a deep learning application out there, right? Deep learning also began a whole bunch of momentum because unlike traditional machine learning, it did not require you 
uh, to figure out features from the data right so in traditional machine learning if you were to learn uh, you know whether this particular image contains a dog or not you had to sort of think what kind of features you could feed to the model you know can you feed uh, uh, you know maybe color histograms or uh, as popularly people call them sift features hog features computer vision made a lot of progress in coming up with awesomely domain specific features in vision right but deep learning guys said hey i don't need any features in fact you know what my model is going to discover new features by itself besides actually doing the classification task which you anyway want to do right for example a face recognition based deep learning model would actually figure out features at different levels of abstraction starting with the simple uh, low level features like edges of a particular direction and uh, shape and so on uh, you know figures of a particular shape and so on to uh, more uh, more more human like features or more features that we care for like shape of noses ears or eyes and so on and then lastly features which can recognize help recognize the ethnicity of people right so for example uh, you know male female mustache hair bald um, or 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 geography and so on right so you know well all this was going on people across fields started pouring their knowledge into deep learning and then image guys said that hey you know we want a special network for 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 images right and they called it convolutional neural networks in fact in 2010 stanford start, started this uh, uh, this effort of creating a, a large database called as ImageNet, uh, where people would upload an image and label what does the image contain. Okay, and they also started doing a ImageNet challenge. They basically said, given this image, tell me what does the image contain automatically. Of course, not a human in picture, right? And if you could basically say, well, it is a steel drum, you would win the challenge. Else, you would basically not win the challenge if you wrongly figured out that this was the stomach of a giant panda or something, right? Visually, it does look like, but it's not, of course, right? So people have been fighting in this challenge with like 1.4 million images uh, since 2010. In 2012, deep learning based model was proposed. And since 2012, deep learning models have been winning this challenge since then, right? Recently, you know, the error rate is as low as 2%. So 98% of the images, uh, automated mechanisms can actually figure out what all is there. In fact, you know, as I teach this thing, uh, one of my students actually had created an app which could actually do this. So, you know, you can install this Android app and point it to wherever uh, you like to, and this model nicely predicts what all you can, what all the phone can see as, as part of the camera. Right. So deep learning models have been getting deeper and deeper year by year. So the latest one, 2016, 17, 18, you know, all recent years have been like 250 plus layers deep. Okay. Deep learning has been used for various kinds of purposes, not just image classification, but for object detection. So, you know, bounding box detection. So here, the person is here, the cake is here, the book is here and so on. And also for uh, solving more difficult problems, like not just detecting objects, like uh, there are two boys and two rackets, uh, but also discovering relationships between them. For example, that the boys are holding the rackets, right? Or figuring out attributes of the boys. For example, the, one of those guys is wearing a red jersey and, uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a blue top and so on, right? And, and um, you know, also uh, so positional relationships as well as other kinds of relationships that one can extract by looking at an image. Also saying that, hey, car has to do nothing with these boys because the fence is there in between and so on, which is which has generally been very easy, of course, for all humans, but difficult for any automated mechanisms. OK, so these deep learning mechanisms have been used for, as I said, image classification, image retrieval, so search by image. So give a flower of this kind, you get other flowers of the similar kind for object detection, driverless cars. Uh, uh, image segmentation, so being able to figure out that this entire thing belongs to a particular person, all these pixels and so on, which we use so happily in as part of uh, Photoshop kind of softwares, right? Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, driverless cars requires a whole bunch of neural networks, neural networks to figure out uh, the thing in front of you is a car and not a leaf lying on the road. The thing in front of you as a pedestrian, you must apply brakes, uh, estimate the speed of the car, read the traffic signs, uh, you know, figure out lane markers and whatnot, right? So it has also been used for uh, enabling nice Kinect kind of experience where you can dance in front of a Xbox and a Kinect combination and uh, uh, you know automatically get scored on how well you danced. Uh, for handwritten OCR, which has been traditionally difficult, uh, uh, you know, even using awesome softwares like Tesseract. Right. So face recognition uh, and so on. You know, in healthcare, deep learning has caused a major, major wave. I have worked with um, uh, you know major health healthcare providers in India as part of my work at Microsoft. Right, with Apollo, with the SL Diagnostics, with the LV Prasad I Institute here, and we've been working. We have been working on all kinds of medical imaging use cases using deep learning. Right. So automatically building uh, maps uh, or even recognizing uh, uh, rare whales, population of those rare whales, all of them are powered using this kind of knowledge, which is there in these CNNs. Right. Uh, now again, I will basically just show you this picture, uh, but not go into details of how a CNN uh, is built. 
contains all of these interesting kinds of layers. It's also a layered architecture after all, but contains convolution, pooling, ReLU layers, and so on. Now the text guys basically said, hey, I want to do better NLP. Can deep learning help me, right? And that is when they came up with these models called as RNNs, LSTMs, and whatnot, right? So, and uh, these, uh, these sequence-based models are useful not just for text, they are actually useful for even speech sequences or, or image sequences. So for example, this handwritten text, if you want to pass it, it's sort of a sequence of characters. If you pass, want to you know, infer something about a video, it's a sequence of images, right? If you want to translate uh, uh, from English to French or French to English and German to English and so on, you know, it's basically a sequence of words. So for all these sequence kind of tasks, people propose deep learning mechanisms called as recurrent neural networks, right? So if you basically have done any kind of basic programming, you know this concept called as recursion and recurrent neural networks basically depend on recursion. That's why they are actually called as recurrent in fact, right? So they have a recurrence relation in the way uh, their neurons work. So each of the neurons sort of does a recurrent task. They basically keep doing the same task over and over again for different units of the input sequence. Now, well, these recurrent neural networks, they were initially motivated by a very simple task, the task that we often use on WhatsApp, right? If you use WhatsApp frequently and you type happy, it suggests you three different uh, suggestions, wedding, birthday, uh, or whatever, right? So essentially happy, happy, holy, right? So, uh, things of that kind. How does it come up with these suggestions, right? Or how does it predict the next word, uh, so to say? So that's what is basically one of those RNN tasks. That is the first task that people started off with. But then people soon realized, hey, this can be actually used for a whole bunch of other things. And you know, for example, for image captioning, so given an image, try to automatically figure out a good caption for it, right? So it helps news reporters a lot, right? Given an image, automatically figure out what kind of caption to put for it, right? Uh, sentiment classifications, so given a, a tweet, can you tell me uh, you know, how many people, uh, uh, so, so if you were tweeting about this lecture, uh, possibly somebody could just write a program to automatically figure out how many people are happy about this lecture, right? Um, so uh, many to many kind of uh, RNNs for machine translation, uh, which is basically by far the most important use case, business use case for RNNs, right? So if you try machine translation now uh, on your favorite, uh, uh, you know, machine translation mechanism, whether it is Google Translate or Bing Translate or whatever Translate, right? You will see a major, major accuracy or quality improvement compared to what it was like five years back, just because RNNs, LSTMs, these kinds of deep learning mechanisms have 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 done their job, right? And even for uh, video analytics, so like video classification and frame level and so on. Now all of them, uh, in fact, people realize you don't just need to use RNNs separately. You can actually combine them with CNNs. So for example, for image captioning, you have an image and picture, but you want to come up with a sequence like a ma old man with a straw hat. This is how you can describe this picture, right? So, uh, and these are, by the way, real captions that have come up uh, automatically from these CNN RN kind of models. So look at it, the top row is so exciting. So man in black shirt is playing guitar, right? Uh, two young girls are playing with Lego toy and so on, right? But the bottom row basically also shows you the fun part of it. Well, these mechanisms don't always work. When you throw them up in the general domain, they fail. Uh, sometimes they just fail, right? For example, the third picture in the lower uh, layer, a woman holding a teddy bear in front of a mirror. Well, that guy looks like a teddy bear, but really is not a teddy bear, okay? So, so you know, when you take them from in a very, very domain specific, uh, uh, you know, kinds of jobs, they work really well. But if you put them in the open, you know, humans are still better. And therefore there's a whole bunch of work which is going on. Deep learning is a continuously growing field. In fact, my students at IIIT Hyderabad, uh, you know, they all do research on deep learning related areas. And we work on various kinds of things like summarization, recommendation systems and uh, style transfer and whatnot. So RNNs and this field basically grew from, uh, you know, I think from 2013 is what I would claim uh, and has been growing so far, you know, various kinds of RNNs, LSTMs, bi LSTMs, various kinds of models have been proposed, encoder, decoder models, attention models, whatnot, right? So, you know, that was a glimpse of uh, um, what I typically cover in my 10 hours, uh, uh, you know, in the class. So, but you know, as a part of this particular short lecture, you know, what I would want to take you to take away is that at least remember these buzzwords, right? That hey, various architectures that somebody talked to you today, right? A single neuron, uh, graduating from a single neuron to a neural network in terms of a layered one called as MLP, multi-layered perceptron. Uh, then we talked about CNNs, CNNs, RNNs, right? CNNs for images, RNNs for text. And then we talked about a whole bunch of, uh, uh, you know, variants uh, that can exist for RNNs uh, called as LSTMs, bidirectional RNNs, stacked RNNs, encoder, decoder, retention models, and so on. Right. Now, of course, uh, given half an hour, this is what we could do. But uh, uh, given 10 hours, we can actually do much. 
so which is what i typically do in the course uh, at, at at isp right okay so that is all from my side uh, so hopefully you enjoyed the session i will hand it over back to pradeep and uh, uh, you know for him to take over and uh, move to the next one all right uh, so uh, first of all uh, thank you everyone for uh, attending this uh, webinar uh, i hope the first two sessions would have significantly helped you in terms of what the program is about uh, learning more from uh, industry as well as uh, faculty members uh, continuing on that uh, this is part of the alumni tag uh, talk so uh, what i'll do is quickly like uh, get into uh, my uh, just one second yeah so uh, very quickly i'll just uh, uh, give my introduction and professional journey uh, what it has been so far uh, and hope some of you could relate to it you might be at different stages of uh, your career journey uh, so i graduated uh, back in 2001 uh, did mechanical engineering and post that as was the uh, flow those days to get into IT. I entered into IT industry, uh, worked there for a little over seven years in uh, Infosys and MDOX. Uh, uh, traditional software development is what I did. And uh, that was the time when Lehman Brothers happened and uh, I was like actually thinking about uh, doing something else beyond uh, IT services, uh, uh, software development. I decided to pursue executive MBA program. Uh, that's what I did full time uh, from NMIMS and uh, was very fortunate while the uh, time was not that great in general 2010 but i was still fortunate i would say to uh, get a good career start into analytics uh, that was the time when i was uh, very briefly introduced into what analytics uh, world was something that really interested me and i uh, was lucky enough to get a break into that uh, worked with hsbc for about a couple of years and uh, then uh, moved over and joined uh, Flipkart in July 2012. And I continue to operate uh, in Flipkart, uh, currently as Senior Director of Analytics there. Uh, look after customer marketing and product analytics. Uh, during the journey at Flipkart, after uh, two, three years, I realized that while I got an opportunity to work in analytics, I still thought my knowledge, in-depth knowledge about analytics was still not up to the mark and with respect to people who had started their career in analytics and data sciences itself so i definitely found a need to be able to do a lot more uh, formal course uh, academic course in that program which could give me a very good understanding depth as well as breadth of what all analytics contain and uh, that is where i was exploring multiple courses and um, i came across uh, ISB program, then it used to be called CBA, Certificate uh, uh, Program in Business Analytics. So something that I was uh, really, really attracted by, and I thought this is the right program, something that I should go after. So did that, uh, of course, uh, a part-time program, uh, did that along with my job. And uh, post that, uh, I'm like uh, finding it very, very useful in the applied world, what we are trying to solve our problems, the way I used to solve those problems earlier, versus what we are able to do now. I think it was a tremendous journey and a tremendous help uh, for my professional growth. So that's uh, uh, brief about uh, my journey, how it has been. Hope some of you would be able to in some form relate to, I'm assuming some of you would also be uh, in IT services industry, different industries. Some of you might already be into analytics, some not, some trying to get into it. So hopefully it uh, gives you some glimpses of the possibilities. Uh, moving on, what I wanted to talk about is, I think uh, uh, Professor uh, Manish uh, gave us a very uh, good uh, insight into deep learning uh, areas, uh, the advanced form of uh, analytics, machine learning, data sciences. Uh, uh, in addition to that, what I would also like us to understand that uh, uh, analytics and data sciences, I've seen it, it's a journey for a lot of us. Uh, and uh, if you look at it, this is something that Gartner uh, talks about as with respect to the overall value chain of analytics and data sciences. So uh, what happens is if you look at it, uh, x-axis is your difficulty level of problem solving and y-axis is the value that you could generate for the business and organization. So typically it starts generally, uh, many of us, I started my career more on the information side, 
which is about more about descriptive analytics like you can call it as business intelligence reporting and all of that a very critical component of analytics which basically talks tells business what has been happening like what has happened in your business measuring multiple kpis and telling business what is happening to the business then people move on to insight generation in terms of identifying why did it happen doing diagnostics rc is root cause analysis many of you would have heard about uh, doing a lot more quantitative analysis looking at data deeply applying quantitative techniques and identifying why certain things are happening the way they are happening so once you know why you also move forward towards predictive analytics journey and this is where you start applying a lot of modeling statistical techniques and so on which is basically to predict the future given what has happened in past knowing why it is happening the way it is happening telling in future what potentially could happen to your business depending on the functional area that you are operating in and the ultimate end outcome could be in terms of optimizations which is about prescriptive anal uh, analytics which is basically yeah this is what future says could potentially happen but it also gets into insight generation and giving foresight into how do you make it happen if you want to grow your business how do you do it that is about the prescriptive analytics so that's the continuum on how you operate in an analytics world and uh, my uh, sincere suggestion is it is not necessarily that everybody will talk about only statistical modeling and so on it's a spectrum where you could actually fit into various aspects of this and what i will do is i'll also talk about certain in terms of what are these various streams available in the industry and what i have seen over my uh, career uh, learning from isb and otherwise like you typically will have these different job families what i would call is a data analyst business analyst and decision or data scientist all of these are captured as part of overall uh, business analytics umbrella uh, so as i called about con uh, connecting it with the previous stuff that i was referring to like you will have job roles opportunities which is across bi reporting data warehousing related stuff uh, then you mo uh, you have areas on business analysis data analysis these could typically be uh, not necessarily statistical models but these are generally quantitative models uh, to understand deeply about what is happening in the business why it is happening the stuff that we spoke about in the previous slide and then uh, there are areas on decision and data sciences which involves uh, machine learning statistical modeling some of the stuff that uh, the professor spoke about earlier on deep learning for example so these are various streams aspects of analytics uh, post this uh, yeah so these are various industries i uh, don't think i would uh, uh, spend a whole lot of time on this uh, which is like uh, like there are services industries which are a lot more broader in nature like uh, infosys of the world who are also getting into analytics then there are niche uh, analytics specialized uh, specialist companies like mu sigma fractal uh, you'll have organizations which are more into consulting like accenture mckinsey and so on then you have a lot of large captive setups uh, like uh, HP, HSBC, City, Target, and so on. And then you have a lot of product organizations which have a lot more in-house analytics, uh, product companies like Flipkart, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, and so on. So these are the various industries and various like small, simple examples of the organizations. And each one of us who are investing heavily on uh, uh, analytics uh, across all the spectrum that uh, we spoke about. Now uh, I'll uh, talk about uh, some of the core competencies or skills that uh, one uh, should be looking forward to building like as you want to uh, be part of uh, analytics areas. Uh, so some of these are core competencies what I would call is like fundamental like the hardcore technical hard skills if you were to call it which is like uh, problem solving this I would say it's more about very very strong quantitative aptitude quantitative thinking is very important. Uh, business thinking is very important uh, like we speak about multiple examples more most often than not what we are trying to solve is trying to solve a business problem so always make sure that you have very very good domain and business understanding uh, followed by analytical solutioning uh, what I mean by this is the spectrum of various analytical techniques modeling techniques everything that uh, this program for example would offer to you uh, having a very good understanding of that is critical because that is the niche that you bring uh, while doing these problem solving uh, then another aspect is data handling 
a data handling by that i would mean know how of multiple tools available in the market whether they are bi tools like uh, tableau clickview power bi kind of tools or it will be like uh, modeling tools whether it is r python uh, uh, spark multiple tools like big data related stuff hive like how to query data like bunch of tools so, so tools understanding is also important so these are some of the hard skills like uh, that you uh, should be building and this program gives a, a pretty good platform on ability to develop uh, uh, all of these skills along with that uh, i call some of the other key competencies these are relatively speaking much more on the softer side and not necessarily the hard skills which is what i would call is storytelling again uh, very critical like you could do plethora of analysis plethora of insights you could generate but if you cannot connect it to the business problem if you cannot connect it to the the clear audience or stakeholder in ability to rightly structure your story what are you trying to communicate that becomes very critical because it's quite likely that you will have so much of a technical understanding technical know-how but that is not something that your end user or a consumer customer stakeholder could necessarily understand so very important how do you translate those technical technical aspects into a simpler story form and be able to communicate that next i would say is intuition uh, personally i believe this is a very significant skill to have i think it is coupled with your business thinking and business understanding while we talk will learn significantly about data related stuff it's also important to have the right intuition basically whatever insights that you generate the outcome that models throw they have to make practical sense and they should somewhere be related to what your general thinking or intuition say then storytelling and co co convincing most of the stakeholders become a lot more easier the third aspect again little related to that is focus on the output which is a lot more actionable and not theoretical in nature uh, whatever insights outcome that you generate needs to be significantly actionable practical something that somebody can run with it uh, on a practical ground uh, last but not the least is about ownership again uh, uh, significantly i would recommend uh, everybody who is entering into this domain not look at the problem purely from uh, data science analytics point of view but think about this problem as something is a business problem that you own and something that you would want to really solve yeah significantly leveraging data technology and so on so these are some of the aspects that uh, something that uh, to be kept in mind yeah so i think uh, that was very brief uh, uh, from my side what are the things that uh, we should uh, focus on uh, fundamentally like i will leave with this keep a laser sharp focus on uh, business objectives what are you trying to solve uh, focus on actionability outcomes that you are generating don't get lost in the uh, technical nitty gritties while it is very critical to know all the technical nitty gritties but not something that your uh, end stakeholder or something uh, somebody might be uh, keen on uh, and focus on what business value impact we are able to generate so uh, yeah so that is the uh, key from my point of view and i think uh, this program uh, in a way is very well structured to cover multiple competencies that i spoke about it will uh, give you opportunity to develop of course a lot of techniques uh, get a good hand on handle on the tools aspect and multiple case studies problems cases that are given that will help you to develop business thinking problem solving capabilities and while you uh, present your uh, assignments problems and so on you can focus on uh, nurturing and building these kind of uh, competencies as well so yeah you'll have the right platform uh, yeah utilize it uh, very effectively Thank you, thank you, Mr. Anurag. Uh, thank you for taking us uh, uh, through the nitty gritties of the analytics value, uh, and also, you know, uh, giving us an heads up on the various uh, streams and job roles uh, that are available within various industries and uh, what an analytics enthusiast or a fresher uh, looking to enter uh, this domain uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the core competencies and skills and the key competencies that they would require uh, to be successful here. So uh, with that, folks, uh, uh, we come to the uh, Q&A session uh, now. Uh, there is an option on the console uh, where you have logged in the chat option, essentially, where you can uh, type the questions that you have uh, and uh, each one of our panelists uh, uh, would be able to answer 
those. So there's an option on, on the console, the chat option, where you can type your, type your questions and we'll be able to help uh, answers for those. So while we wait uh, for people to ask the questions, uh, uh, we have a few questions already uh, in, in the system. Uh, let me go through those. Right. Uh, I think this this question uh, is by uh, Gaurav, and uh, this question is addressed to uh, Shrikant. Uh, and his question is that uh, if he believes that despite the technology technology advancements, uh, should they still follow agnostic approach for uh, model building? But I think. Uh... You know, Dr. Manish and that one talk about talked about the advancements which is done in the industry, right? I mean, whether it's deep learning, LSTM models, CNNs, and RNN sequence based models, all that. But end of the day, all I was trying to uh, inculcate was, you know, even what Anshwan was saying, Anurag was saying, which is, you know, is your problem? Are you are you aware of the problem uh, clearly when you before you start of the project, right? And uh, understand even if you get a clarity or even a 60 percent of clarity on okay this is what the chief supply chain officer of this company wants to know on logistics you know even if you get that element into your thinking i think you 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 love you are on a pedal to start you know to start the project well right and 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 keep in mind that there there are too many unknown unknowns as you uh, you know as you start the journey right uh, because it is a black web and there is there are unknown unknowns because you will unnerve to them more and more and how do you convert that unknown unknowns to known unknowns and then eventually known knowns is what what how the journey would be right so in that sense you know i would still start with maybe i will start with the traditional approach and see how it evolves maybe it requires a simple mathematical model or a simple rule based model so don't over engineer everything but if you understand the problem well, you would know what approach to take. This is what my view is. Okay, okay. Thank you, Srikant. Uh, uh, we have another question uh, by Pratik. Uh, he, he essentially wants to know how much of a statistics knowledge is actually essential for understanding and, and ML and AI concepts in, in general. How much of statistic knowledge is actually required in really understanding AI and ML concepts? Uh, Dr. Manish, if you're there, uh, would you be able to take this up? Uh, sure. So, uh, you know, uh, so the idea is as follows. Um, um, there are two ways of looking at uh, anything, right? Either you look at from a broad breadth perspective or you look at uh, concepts from a depth perspective, right? So, and uh, the idea is, uh, you know, depending on how much time we have uh, for learning things and uh, uh, what is the relevance of depth versus breadth, we essentially try to uh, sort of strike a trade off between these depth and breadth right so uh, now uh, with that background right i would try to answer the question so the idea is that you know if you had all the time in the world uh, a very good base of statistics would be very essential uh, so that you can actually understand the deepest of things that are happening in aiml world right uh, however you know for most of the business use cases for most of the things that you would do uh, uh you know as part of your job uh, after you do this thing um i believe you do not really need that kind of exact understanding of how a particular uh, uh, you know optimization problem is solved and so on so so in short you know for most of real world things you really do not need that depth of statistics so even if you uh, sort of remember some basics uh, that is more than enough in fact uh, uh, in the course itself we basically cover whatever uh, uh, predicts are required like in 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 a module called statistics but in general if you want to sort of uh, unless you want to become like an ai scientist or something uh, and and remember when i say scientist i don't mean like a data scientist which is a very abused term these days so unless you want to so by that I, ai scientist i meant like unless you want to do a phd or something you know you really do not need very deep statistics all you need is very uh, shallow uh, basic statistics and that will more or less help you in understanding most of the tools that are there as part of this AI, ML, or deep learning journey. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully that okay. answers. Uh, yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manish. Uh, we have another question by uh, Avril Mathur. Uh, now the question is, 
for a mid-level manager uh, what would be the suggestion as a path for expanding and highlighting their data analytics skills uh, specifically for a mid-level managerial role is what his question is uh, uh, anurag would you be able to take this up yeah sure so uh, i would say it uh, it depends on like when you say uh, mid level manager a clarity would be mid level manager in the space of uh, analytics already or into it services or into business side i think if we have that clarity that would help uh, having said that i think but most often than not assuming let us say we are referring to somebody who is into either the uh, business area already or into like say areas like account management and things like that where you are uh, working with your clients i think uh, having a good breadth breadth of understanding of these different aspects of applied analytics and data sciences would be of great value because that way i think it becomes very easier for you to have the right kind of conversation with your either clients, stakeholders, whoever you are uh, working with. I think that helps tremendously. I think, uh, for example, if I take my own personal example, I think I was pretty much at that stage when I did this program and something I found tremendously value that uh, earlier I would have known, for example, only one or two areas. And now the spectrum, how it is uh, like spreading significantly across multiple areas, it's good to know multiple techniques and algorithms etc available so that any kind of a discussion problem solving you are into it gives you a good handy tools that you know at least for these kind of a problems these could be applied even though you may not necessarily have done each and everything yourself but a know-how of the spectrum of these things i would say would come very very handy at uh, this juncture of the career okay okay got it got it thank you mr uh, uh, we have another question Oh, one second. Yeah, yeah uh, uh, I think uh, this question is from Akash. Like, uh, what should a beginner uh, do if he has to, uh, you know, commence his journey on specifically uh, machine learning skill set? As in, his question is, what should he do or what should he start uh, looking at in terms of getting his hands on machine learning? Dr. Manish, would you be able to answer this question? Yeah, so, uh, you know, if you are a beginner in this particular thing, uh, um, yeah. see, I mean, whether you are, so, I mean, so, yeah, I mean, when you're a beginner, right, uh, the basic problem that you have is that there is so much of stuff out there that you don't know where to start. I think that is the main, main problem. And and you also have this fear that, hey, if I don't uh, start now, I it will be very difficult to catch up. You also have this fear of not knowing things. You basically are like, hey, uh, those five guys in my company actually do something machine learning. I don't even understand what do they do, right? And uh, so, so so that is where you are. Uh, I mean, my, many people are in that sense, right? And, and then it is more like, hey, there's so much to learn. How do I learn? So, uh, you know, some basic ideas of course if you had all the time in the world you the best way of learning is to explore yourself because when you explore for when you are searching for something you actually end up uh, uh, you know uh, knowing 10 other things in the path and that's the best way of learning but uh, that is a hard and uh, a time taking way of learning and that is why you know these courses which are there especially the isb course and and other similar courses are externally as well right they help you provide a path they basically tell you in what sequence to learn, uh, you know, which of those concepts. And in fact, you know, uh, uh, beyond that, they also go ahead and tell you what to learn and uh, how to best learn it, right? Even within within those broad topics, what is the best way of uh, looking at concepts one by one, right? So that is, uh, of course, one way of learning, guided learning, as I would call it, right? But in today's world, right, I think uh, things evolve very fast. So while this guided learning is good, uh, I think, uh, and of course, I mean, you know, for any kind of learning, I assume you have the basic things of curiosity, right? Basic thing called curiosity. If you are not curious, if you do not have, uh, uh, you know, a knack for learning, it's very difficult to learn, whether from a guided source or from uh, from by, by yourself, right? So, but even if, you know, this guided learning is there, in today's world, uh, you know, you can't be learning from one, so just a single source. For example, uh, you know, I like to learn about the same thing from some from multiple from multiple sources. I mean, I read papers. So, you know, if you want to really get keep keep yourself updated with this, which you know about whatever is happening recently, 
you would really read the papers but uh, when you read research papers the idea is uh, you don't uh, uh, understand them fully so there are awesome interpretations through very very nicely written blogs right so besides this guided learning i think uh, this uh, augmented learning is also very important so you read a whole bunch of blogs okay uh, uh, you you see a whole bunch of videos which give you another perspective about learning the same thing and you understand it much better actually right Uh, now besides doing that uh, uh, this particular field uh, data science is also about hands on learning right so uh, as as uh, our other speakers you know uh, uh, have also mentioned uh, you know shrikant anurag right that uh, uh, you know learning is one thing but applying is another so unless you experience things you can't you can't uh, you can't understand the worth of your learning so therefore it is very also, also very important to participate in things like kaggle competitions right through which you can actually experience how a project looks like or actually you know then start working in a real data scientist job right so i think those are the steps of sort of uh, starting yourselves to getting into a data science job but getting into a data science job is the beginning of it by the way because you need to continuously keep yourself updated continuously keep learning more and more and more every day right so so yeah, yeah that's, that's the answer yeah yeah sure thank you thank you dr manish uh, we have another question by salman Uh, his question is uh, more specific to do about the program at ISP. He's asking, uh, what sort of flexibility does the program offers in terms of putting extra efforts on if doing if they're interested in doing a personal research or you know technical research or business uh, paper research. Uh, essentially, in terms of what uh, the ABMPA program offers its students in terms of being flexible. Uh, I think uh, Rajesh should you be able to take this up. Yeah, I assume Pradeep, you are able to hear me. Yes, yes, Rajesh, please go ahead. Okay, okay. Uh, in terms of uh, what is there for students who are at ISB, you know, it's uh, pretty clear in that. I mean, uh, ISB is a great place. I would not want to get into the details of it. I think uh, Professor Manish and uh, Anurag had dealt on the kind of possibilities that happen. It's a place for transformation. Uh, with respect to your specific question on, you know, uh, supporting technical writing or research papers, yes, we have seen in the past that there are good number of uh, students. When I mean students, you know, in ISB, uh, the class of analytics students are approximately with an average of eight years of experience, ranging from two years of experience to 25, 26 years of experience. That's the kind of range that we have in the class. I mean, that talks about a tremendous diversity as well. So people come with various skill sets. Each, you know, there are a few who are very interested in writing research papers. They co-write papers with the faculty. You know, uh, it depends on the area that you need to, you want to invest yourself in. And uh, I think in India, there would not be a better place for you to support uh, on these initiatives, be it in research, be it in technical writing, we have seen some excellent startups bloom. Of course, you know, people who want career benefits, they definitely, uh, you know, see their efforts in the program translated to their career uh, on the resume as well. So, yes, we give you a platform. How much each student utilizes ISB is up to them. That's the long answer short. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Rajesh. Uh, uh, there's one other question. I think possibly Rajesh, you can take it yourself. Uh, uh, this is a question by Faisal. He's a 51 year old uh, working for a global company as manufacturing director. He uh, currently has no experience in programming or data analytics, uh, but he would like to change his career to data science. Uh, is it something that he should explore at this stage or not? What do you, what do you recommend? Okay. Um, interesting question we see a lot of profiles yeah. like this and uh, it's not uh, completely i mean his profile is not an outlier for sure i just did mention that you know we have people with 25 30 years of experience and i'm sure he fits into that particular segment now coming from a typical manufacturing setup i'm sure that he is very concerned about his applicability of his knowledge into this so the answer that we typically give for people who are experienced professionals, especially with 15 plus years of experience is that it's, uh, you know, the beauty of analytics is that it has proliferated into every sector, every vertical, every industry, every function. There is nothing that is not touched by it. So I would suggest, and I'm sure, you know, others on the panel also would agree is that 
please do something that will further your for example if you are a person in manufacturing sector there is a huge number of case studies and used cases currently in analytics used for manufacturing sector specifically so if i were in his place i would pick up this i would pick up this new skill sets that you know a possibly in an institute like isb will provide and further my career in analytics but in the manufacturing industry so in that way there would be a logical path of what i would want to do and i can further my past with a very meaningful future as well and uh, i mean I, I i remember in a couple of batches before we had a person who was working for a national minerals development corporation in mdc having only experience in mines and minerals and stuff like that and he was very ably able to pick up this particular program appreciate the concepts and uh, you know further now he's joined vedanta in their mining division and he's heading their analytics for mining for vedanta very interesting transition but very relevant sure that's really great to know rajesh i mean uh, somebody with 15 plus experience still uh, you know delving into the field of analytics through and isp is facilitating uh, that journey uh, in, in, any uh, uh, final thoughts uh, from the panelists on you know uh, specifically for enthusiasts who are looking to begin their journey in the data science uh, and given the current scenario what's happening outside any uh, last last thoughts that the panelists would have yeah i think i would just um, you know uh, sort of summarize uh, uh, my uh, current thoughts by saying that uh, uh, data science is a is a massively growing field right and i say the same thing about deep learning so you know deep learning which is a small part of data science is actually growing insanely as well uh, the only way to survive in uh, today's uh, uh, you know fast world is to actually continuously learn every day right so yeah. if you basically want to take away something you know at whatever uh, stage of career you are at uh, so you know just to tell you one uh, very uh, relatable experience uh, we uh, due to this covid situation we have been doing uh, online uh, lectures within microsoft also we also keep doing these deep learning courses within microsoft and you won't believe uh, you know uh, head of bing at microsoft india he actually attended all these deep learning sessions so look at this guy you know a 55 year old plus guy right attending these sessions deep learning sessions now uh, look at his passion look at his the curiosity right and that is something that one can take away i think uh, from this session that hey whatever life stage whatever career stage whatever stage you are at keep learning keep learning keep learning i think that's the way to uh, to survive actually sure sure dr manish uh, that's a really good uh, you know uh, parting uh, knowledge Uh, that you have provided to our attendees so uh, i think we have completely run out of time uh, for today's uh, master class session it's been great to uh, host all the three uh, presenters uh, mr anurag singhvi uh, thank you for uh, joining us and taking our uh, audience through various facets of uh, competencies uh, uh, that they would require uh, to begin their careers in data science and dr manish thank you for taking us through uh you know the various facets of uh, machine learning and deep learning uh and uh, mr shrikant menon from gentact for his views on uh, what's happening in the current space and how one can uh, go about you know uh, their data science journey and rajesh from isb for answering those questions on advanced management program and business analytics so with that folks uh, i would like to thank you thank each one of you for joining on to this session and we look forward to seeing you in our upcoming master class sessions uh, in the near future thank you once again thank you pradeep for attend you know organizing such a lovely meet and i'm sure it is fruitful and useful for many of us here thank you absolutely thank you rajesh thank you thank, thank you. you pradeep thank you everyone thank you thank you everyone